Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second En Route to COP26 um, session. Um, this is the first thematic session, um, and it's going to look at how national climate plans um, enable the transition to sustainable transport. Um, this is um, the second session today, um, and we're very looking forward to having you with us um, for the next um, two and a half hours. My name is Mark Major, and um, I'm, from the, I'm the Senior Advisor with the Sustainable Low Carbon Transport Partnership, one of the 10 organisations that has um, uh, put this conference uh, together um, over the next three days. Next slide, please, Angela. Okay, um, normal online meeting etiquette, please. Please keep yourselves muted. Um, feel free to turn on your camera if you wish to. We're happy to see you. Um, and please use the, the, the question box and the chat function to exchange, ask questions um, um, and interact um, um, during the session. That's a value part of, valuable part of the online experience. Um, and there's a possibility for people to, to reply and respond. Um, so please um, take advantage of those online features. Next slide, please. So um, the purpose of En Route, um, we're 11 months today till we should be meeting in Glasgow, Glasgow for the delayed COP26. Um, and this is the moment where we try to bring together the, the global sustainable low carbon transport community to make sure that we have clear messages um, on, on the way to decarbonize transport, particularly in the, concept, in the context of the, um, uh, the economic reset post-COVID, um, to take a stock for a moment on where we are with the nationally determined contributions and long-term strategies, all climate policy jargon, which I'll explain in a few minutes. Um, and importantly, in this session, we're gonna be kind of looking at this from the perspective of different stakeholders, um, the roles and the contributions of different stakeholders. Um, and importantly, this, this activity, you know, we're not meeting in Glasgow as was planned, um, is, is to keep the momentum for our, our work on decarbonizing tra transport and try and build linkages and bridges and stepping stones um, during 2021 so that we actually progress um, over the next 11 months. So this is just um, one of 12 sessions that are happening over three days at different times, um, according to different global audiences. On, on 10 thematic topics. Um, and please um, take advantage of the link you're using now um, to, to join other sessions at other times. All of these sessions are being recorded um, and will be available for streaming um, um, afterwards um, from the Eventbrite link where you initially registered. Okay. So we're gonna be looking at um, the link between sustainable transport and these national climate strategies and plans. Um, and, and the opportunities now around um, the current context of post-COVID um, to, to, to make a step change in the action and make sure we're in better shape um, by the time we get to, to Glasgow next year, as I say, in 11 months time. And we're going to be trying to do this um, by bringing um, a focus on different perspectives, country perspectives, expert perspectives, um, and also a range of other stakeholders. So we're gonna be looking at this from three different perspectives over the next um, two hours. Um, next slide, please. And, and we've broken this down into, into five segments for you. I'm gonna give you um, a welcome and an introduction um, in just a minute to, to bring people into the picture of exactly where we are now. Um, and then we're gonna look into the country perspectives. Um, and during, there'll be two sessions, two moments during this um, seminar when we will be asking you for your, your views, um, answering a couple of questions, so pay attention. So there's clues to the answers in some of the, in some of the slides. Um, then we'll be talking with two experts um, that work around the world on this topic. What have they learned in their work on these topics? And finally, we're gonna go to um, an expert, a panel um, of thinkers, leaders in our community um, to get their different perspectives um, on how we can improve and do more. Okay. Next slide, please. So here we are, um, just a few weeks from the end of the Kyoto Protocol second commitment period. So since 1997, the Kyoto Protocol has been the regime which has governed um, global climate action. 
And in just a few weeks on the 1st of January, we'll switch to the Paris Agreement from 2015 being the, the governing um, uh, agreement for transport. So this is for, for the climate action. This is a significant change. Um, but um, nationally determined contributions, these nationally bottom up national plans um, are a key feature of the Paris Agreement. Um, but the good news is that um, we already have a lot of experience with national action. Um, a key element of the Kyoto Protocol was that certain countries took on binding commitments and we saw that they worked. So for the first Kyoto Protocol period, um, the, the 36 countries that fully participated in that, um, they committed to reduce their emissions by 4% um, from 1990 levels um, by 2012. And actually they delivered minus 13%. So we see that this approach to national action can really work. So um, that's the good news. Um, the not such good news is that during the period that those countries were reducing their emissions by 13% overall, their transport emissions grew 17%. So this is the challenge that's ahead of us. And if we look at the emissions um, of transport since 1990, um, looking back just 30 years, next slide please. You see that transport emissions have gone up 60% since 1990. So um, this is a good illustration of the last 30 years and the challenge we face looking ahead. Um, one positive aspect is that in the last decade or so, you to start to see a decoupling between transport emissions um, and GDP. You see that those two curves starting to separate. Okay, so the challenge we face as we are looking ahead is on the blue, in the blue shadow here, you can see like a, an amalgam of all the different um, business as usual scenarios from different research for transport, um, going from about the 10 and a half, 11 gigatons. So that's um, 10,500 million tons um, of emissions um, of uh, CO2 equivalent per year. That's the equivalent to a country like China. So instead of those going up to something like, um, 14 or 15 gigatons in the next 30 years, we need to be reducing those emissions to something like two gigatons. And the, and the reduction scenarios um, are shown there in yellow. So we need to be going from maybe 14 gigatons um, on a different pathway down towards two in a period of time from, 20, from now to 2050, which is actually a similar period than the period of time we're looking back to 1990 and 1992 when the framework convention was agreed. So while it's no doubt that national actors are in the lead um, in the submission and the preparation of these plans, um, it, it's clear that actually for the successful implementation, and I'd also argue for the successful development of these plans, many, many different stakeholders have an important role to play, whether that's subnational actors, cities, civil society, um, investors, they all have a role to play and actually how they all fit together, how they find their place. Um, and we have these actors engaged, aligned and committed to this process is, is going to be key to the success of actually driving, driving transport reductions. So that's a little bit of the introduction. So now we'd like to get your feedback on a few points, see what you know about transport decarbonisation. So we invite you to, on your phone, on another window, to go to menti.com and enter the code 89460058. Hopefully that's also in the chat and the link's in the chat. So you can um, access that. And please give us your answer to these three, these four questions. menti.com. 89.46.058. It'd be great if someone could put the link in the chat so people can just click on it. Um, so first question. Do you think transport can be decarbonized globally by 2060? So that's, that's, the, first, that's the first question. The second question, okay. Here we go, we're coming, the answers are coming through.
Okay, there's wait just a couple of minutes to see the answers develop. So majority saying yes, a significant number saying they don't know. Okay, so what I can share with you is that in a recent study that was done for the German government, who interviewed 350 um, transport experts from around the world, 72% um, of the experts felt that transport could be decarbonized globally by 2060. So 72% of experts interviewed think this can be achieved globally by 2060. So um, more optimistic um, than those of you that have responded to this question here today. So more optimism from the, the interviewed experts. Next question, please. What percentage of second generation NDCs have transport targets? So we're seeing countries now sending in their revised second generation nationally determined contributions. We know that transport is, is the first or second largest source of emissions, fastest growing source of emissions um, in most countries. So what percentage of any second generation NDCs do you think have transport targets? Okay, this doesn't seem to be the right question. Okay. Waiting to get the answers in. Okay. Fifteen percent, thirty-four percent, or fifty-nine percent. So, what percentage of second-generation NDCs? Yeah. Okay. Pretty even split here. It's great, thank you for all your answers. So in the review we did um, of the NDCs that were submitted originally up until August um, 2016, only 8% of the NDCs had transport targets. So on the one hand you have transport being a major source and fast growing source of emissions. On the other hand, in nationally determined contributions, um, less than one in 10 had a, a transport target. The good news is that from the ones that are coming in now, um, and we've managed to look at 13 so far, um, three of the ones that have come in have transport targets so far. So that would be almost a quarter. So if that trend continues while being far from adequate, it shows that there does seem to be a significant increase um, in transport targets in NDCs. Okay, next question quickly, we should move on. How many LTSs have been submitted? Um, this is another feature of the Paris Agreement. How many have been submitted so far? Okay, so the majority, majority view here are right. Um, 19 have been submitted so far. So out of the 197 parties to the, to the Paris Agreement, um, we're seeing that of that 196, only 19 have submitted these long-term strategies. And this is part of the delay we're seeing um, due to COVID. Okay, last question. Do you think that the transport climate action is on track? And this is the one you answered earlier. And so that's interesting. So approximately half think that transport climate action 
global policy is on, on track, about a third of you don't. Okay, that's, uh, that's a really interesting insight. So at least half of you um, think we need to be doing more. Okay, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much for, the, for the participating in the Menti. We'll be coming back to that later. Um, so we were using these abbreviations in that, um, in that poll and apologies for that. Um, the climate, climate, national climate plans feature in two ways in the Paris Agreement. One through these short-term climate action plans, which each party to the convention, the 196 are supposed to prepare, communicate, maintain and implement. I mean, the purpose of the plan is that you have the intention to implement it. And this is, this is really the basis for climate action um, in the shorter term. Um, and parties are invited to submit those every five years, and they generally have a, a five to 10 year um, horizon. The other aspect is the long term strategy, which is, it, which is a tool for countries to map out their long term climate objectives. And of course, the short term actions should be on the pathway to delivering the long term, the long term strategies and the, and the pathway to get there. So ideally, these two things should be working well together, although what we see is actually there's, there's a relatively poor articulation between the two at the moment, um, and that can certainly improve. But what I want to underline here is that this terminology and this architecture of the Par Paris Agreement is going to be stable from now until 2050. So what we're learning about this cycle of NDCs, what we're like learning about how to prepare these and implement them and how we link them to long term strategies is a cycle that is going to be repeating every five years. So it's really important that we not only do a good job, but we learn from what we're doing, what works and what doesn't, um, so we can move on. Um, as I said, um, the transport community got together and analysed the, the, the NDCs um, in the first round, and this gave us lots of insights into what was there and what wasn't, how much they were addressing passengers or freight, which kind of measures they were, 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 were using. Next slide, please. Um, we also use this analysis to see, okay, there's three strategies to address transport emissions, avoid, shift and improve. We know that an avoid and shift can deliver about the same level of reductions as improve. Um, so we need to use all three of these, these strategies to, to succeed in decarbonizing transport. Yet we see in the first round um, that only a fraction of the NDCs um, address avoid and shift strategies and have a huge emphasis on these improved strategies. So better vehicles, lighter vehicles, better operations, better fuels, et cetera, higher, um, higher utilization. So um, that's clearly something. And so these analysis gave us an insight into what um, countries are including in NDCs. Next slide, please. And this helped us um, devise 10 policy messages for, for countries, what you need to do to include transport in your NDC. And we developed these 10 messages with a whole range of, of public and private partners um, last, uh, over the last year. And these have been the subject of an active campaign. Um, we've been tweeting these 10 messages. We've provided examples, best practice, links. Um, and we also wrote with these recommendations to all the 197 UNFCCC parties um, over the last year. So, you know, this is the, the value of these kind of analysis and insights because it helps us work out what is missing and what needs to be improved. So um, the links are in these presentations. Um, we also should be putting some of the links in the chat as well. Take advantage of these resources. That campaign, that material is also available in Spanish, a lot of it in French as well. Next slide, please. So take advantage of these resources. Okay, looking ahead, we're doing the same, but even more detailed analysis of the new NDCs that are coming in. Um, this is a joint um, initiative between GIZ, German Development Corporation, and the SLOCAT partnership um, with WRI, ITF, um, and ITDP. And this is going to be an open online um, uh, resource that is already available for you. Next slide, please. Um, it gives you all kind of information about how, about the general context, what the transport, how it's covered, the governance aspects, mitigation, adaptation aspects. Next slide, please. 
And this enables us to kind of really get a, will allow us, allow us to get a clear picture of the coverage of transport in NDCs. You know, how complete are the action? Are they again only focused on certain modes or certain types of actions? Um, and maybe to get a clearer picture of the progress we're making from the first generation to the second generation. And of course, inform our policy and advocacy um, in the years ahead. Um, these findings will be included in the um, SLOCAT's flagship transport and climate change status report, which will be launched early next year. And I come to the end of my presentation by here. Um, you have on the right side the link to um, all this information and, and the database for the 13 NDCs that we've already come in is already there. So we're going to be keeping that database updated with all the NDCs that come in so that many of you around the world are interested to see maybe from a policy perspective, what are other countries doing? Um, how do they tackle these problems or an academic pers perspective? Who's doing what? What kind of measures there have access to that information? That's all a resource there available for you for free. Next slide, please. So this brings us to the... Um, to the end of my introduction. Thank you for your, your patience. I hope that was useful to set the scene. Lots of jargon, um, lots of abbreviations. Um, so the challenge is how do we make these national climate plans meaningful tools to actually reduce emissions? Um, as I said earlier on, we've seen that other sectors have successfully reduced their emissions under these national climate plans, um, but we haven't seen that very much so far for transport. So. The first part now is to um, turn to the panel. Um, and I'd like to, to get two country perspectives. Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce Gustavo Realdi from the Ministry of Transport um, in Argentina. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope you're enjoying a lovely summer um, down there in, in Argentina. Yeah, summer, summer is starting yet. Welcome to start with it. It's, 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 yeah. it's, 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 so, so, as I said, um, countries are key actors in this process. You have this responsibility for developing um, and implementing these plans. So, first of all, can you please introduce yourself um, and your work? Okay. Good morning to everyone. Uh, sorry about, uh, about my English. I, I would uh, need some translation later. Uh, Mark, I, I think you can help me with, with translation, please. Uh, well, my name is Gustavo Rinaldi. I'm the head of the Office of Environmental Impact of Transportation in Argentina. Uh, it's the first time that Argentina has uh, a, a specific office uh, in charge of uh, environmental impact of of transportation that is a, a really a really huge uh, change I, I think no uh, if you if you note that we are trying to change the perspective change, change the, the way of, of we we see the 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 environmental uh, issue uh, and we are trying to Abord it or to, to get charge of it from the transport uh, sector, not from not not, not leaving it uh, in the environmental sector. Uh, we are trying to get charge on it in uh, in the transport uh, transport sector. I, I think that that is a, a huge change uh, of, of perspective, and and that involves. Uh, uh, Dialoguing with the with all the sectors, with all the real actors of the of the transport, and uh, uh, trying to um, generate or generate uh, conscience. Uh, I, I don't know it's conscience the the, the word, uh, but awareness about the the problem, and uh -huh. trying to 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 generate politics or to to develop politics uh, with with. Uh, enough. Uh, uh, how do you say um, consenso, Mark? Uh, I con consenso. Sorry. Consensus. Consensus. It's 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 a K it's it's a K it's a K factor uh, yeah. to the implementation of the of the politics we can develop. If we don't have a consensus, is is impossible then. 
to to implement the, that we we develop what we think uh, and i think the the environmental law the 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 more uh, important problem it, it has is the implementation uh, and here in the world and in argentina we are uh, it's, it's like a, a theater we we play uh, that we we have a uh, good loss or good, uh, but then it is it's very difficult to, to implement it is it's really we, we have to to put the the focus or put the eye in the implementation of the of the mission of the of the actions we we think it's, it's i think there there is the the, the main the main point of the of the question. Yeah, absolutely. There's a huge risk that you end up with this gap between what's on paper and what's actually implemented. And and and, and thank you for you immediately underlining this kind of role of consensus and aligning stakeholders. It, interesting to know that you've got you know a, a special unit within the Ministry of Transport working on climate. It'd be very interesting to know how many other ministries around the world have that mm -hmm. that arrangement. Um, so you had a new climate law in Argentina last year. Um, can you tell us how how the implementation of that law is is going in the transport sector? Okay, I I, I will speak Spanish this part. It's okay, and uh, you can translate it. I can try, please. I can try. Okay, okay, try. I use it. Okay, um, well, we have we have a no. I can try it in English. We have started a, a process last uh, this year. Trying to to involve all the ministers uh, in the in the question in the in the issue uh, about climate change uh, is it's very difficult to articulate or to coordinate uh, the the politics the politics of the all the all the ministers in, in Argentina. Uh, we are trying to coordinate between the production the science and technology, the economy uh, minister, uh, the energy minister, the energetic minister, the minister of energy in, in Argentina, or the, the secretary of, uh, of energy is, is my, my mate in the, in the question, is my principal mate, my principal partner in, in question relate, related to, to transport. I, I, th there's a, only a few uh, models of transport that doesn't work with uh, with fuel. Uh, just I just walking or cycling. Uh, if if you if you go out of this these models, uh, you have to to think about how to to give to give fuel or to give combustible to to that to that model. So. Uh, Ministry uh, or the Secretary of Energy uh, in Argentina is the is a, a partner that I have to work every day uh, because uh, we we have a, a we have a particular situation in, in Argentina about the shale gas. Uh -huh. We have a, a lot of shale gas in in South of Argentina, so. Uh, we have uh, to consider that situation, and in the transition, energetic, uh, energetic transition is. We have to consider that uh, we have also a lot of uh, soil, uh, so, not not so soy, is so, soya, uh, or or bio biogas. Yeah, we have a lot of biogas, so bio, bio combustible, bio biodiesel. So we are considering that uh, that uh, forms of combustible or fuel uh, to to the tra transition in transport, and we are we we, we have um, long distance also in Argentina. Argentina is a huge country, so the the freight transport has to attend that reality and really. It's, it's not possible to, to think this uh, part of the story about electrification uh, of freight transport. You know, 
freight transport in, in Argentina is mostly in its uh, road transport. We don't have. Uh, we are we are trying to uh, to develop a roll on roll, on roll uh, or piggyback uh, systems. You mm -hmm. know that uh, well, that systems where uh, trucks go on trains. Yep. Um, we are trying to develop that one and trying to uh, to articulate our an intermodal uh, situation between um freight transport by roads or by train in that in that mode in that mode mm -hmm. so um the the situation is is it's not easy uh, really we have to to we had a very special situation in, in Argentina about the about the change of the technology of electric or, or going to electrification. We have uh, some steps previously, uh, and uh, and we are trying to 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 go go that steps you now to. to the... Yeah, thank, th thank you, th thank you very much. I mean, great. You, you touched already on the energy aspects and this. The, the, the important questions about um, freight um, and long distance freight, that's, that's also, do, do you, what do you, uh, what measures are you looking at for urban transport or maybe non-motorized transport? Do you have a specific measures for urban mobility? Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're trying to, to impulse, to, to promote. Uh, you, you know, Argentina is a huge country, it's a federal country. And it has a lot of uh, cities, uh, very tired. And we are accustomed to, to things, uh, most of the politics in a city, in a city vision. I, I, but uh, we are trying to, to involve the, the, the vision, the, the federal vision, uh, and, and trying to, to impulse or to promote uh, the use of bikes in, in the small in the small cities on the cities that uh, not not the not the capitals of the states uh, trying to, to think or to 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 yeah to promote to to to, to join the small cities to uh, in, in using bikes, in, in using public bikes or public bike systems, trying to 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 develop that that sort of, that sort of systems uh, in in the small cities, not just in the big cities, uh, because we, uh, as, as I was saying, uh, we all we always think uh, in in Buenos Aires or in Cordoba, in, in big cities. And we forgot about all the, the rest of the country. So we are trying to. Very good. We, we, that, that, that's very important. We, we often see this case with this obsession with very big cities. Um, and of course, the majority of people are li living in, 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 in secondary or, or, or small cities. So that, that's, yeah. um, that, that's very important. You, you already shared with us very kindly at the beginning one key message from you, which is this, this need for consensus, um, the need for, for aligning yeah. people to building consensus. Um, to, 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 to conclude this first part of this um, uh, discussion, are, are there any other success factors? And what, from your experience, what other key factors are there for success in your work? I, I think uh, Dialogue, dialogue is is is, is a, a, a key a, a key factor. Uh, we have to to talk with every stakeholder to be open. Uh, it's it's. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I was reading the the chat. Great approach by Argentina. Has Argentina considered or working on targets to become? Uh, we are we're working on the NDC. Uh, we we. We are going to, to include the transport, uh, the transport in the NDCs. Uh, these, these things I was telling you about the multimodal or the intermodal situation. We are trying to uh, involve uh, shipping, uh, aviation too, as you, as you said. Uh, 
we are we are trying to to, to involve gender uh, and inclusion into the climatic uh, policies, not just uh, thinking about the climate. Uh, the, the politics uh, about climate has to to include uh, has to include all the you know Argentina is a, a, a country with a lot of people uh, under the line of poverty. Uh, so we have to to think how the the climate policies uh, help to to include that people. And uh, okay, on that on one hand, and on the other hand, the, the gender uh, politics are other other things that we are very worried about. So we we are trying to to consider transport, gender, and climate. Uh, it's, it's a it's a it's, we are trying to, to get it together. Fantastic. Um, Thank you very much. Great, great to hear. I mean, you mentioned aviation and maritime, you know, very often countries forget to think of this kind of integrated, the way the systems are integrated together and maybe so often miss aviation and maritime issues. So that's great. Um, many people will be interested to hear about your covering gender and inclusion as, as part. So th thank you very much for this, this context, Gustavo. Um, you spoke very clearly and very calmly. You know the, the, the last the, the last thing is about so, so sovereignty or so, sovereign who do you say sovereignty uh, sovereignty I, I think I think it, it's, it's very it's very important it's very it's, it's very important to to remark uh, about so about this uh, and about uh, trying our our solutions uh, Argentinian solutions to Argentinian problems. Not import solutions, not not a solution that uh, has worked on another countries that doesn't have our situation, our particularities. I was saying about uh, shale gas, or we are a country that is really far uh, from Europe, or or China, or USA, or we are we are in the south of the south. So we, we have a singularity, and we work with that. We, 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 don't, we don't want uh, magic solutions. We don't want uh, that um, the, the solution from Argentina come from uh, another, another experience that doesn't match Argentina. Argentina is a, a very industrial side. In, uh, with with uh, a very big in industry sector, uh, with a, a lot of, of particularities, so a lot of singularities. So we are we are working on that. We don't we don't want uh, magic solutions or solution or important solutions. We are trying to as we are yep. saying the the, so the Argentinian solution for the for the situation for yep. the for the. Uh, because because we, we have tried we, ha we have already tried with, with other solutions it doesn't work it doesn't yeah. work when we, we, we you try to to copy and paste uh, plans from another country so we you try to to make uh, commitments that you then you can't uh, uh, go, go for it or you, you can co comply with your, your commitment Okay. So I think it's time to 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 be serious. It's time to uh, work with the Argentinian reality, and not uh, to to import or to copy another another solutions. Uh, it's, it's, it's what about I was what I say is consensus, is dialogue, is implementation, is Argentinian reality. That's the the, the line we are we are uh, going through. Thank you very much, Gustav. We're going to have to, to, to stop with you there um, because we're running out of time. I think many people have been very interested to, to listen to you. Um, your last message about this kind of local context is something we see in many places. You describe the, the geography of the country, the, the energy issues, the, the, the urbanization issues that all affect that you need your, your solutions that fix your situation. So thank you very much. Consensus, reality and implementation. That's the three three key words from your. So, so thank you very much. Please stay with us. Um, now okay. I'd like to turn to um, Mr. Sidentu from the National Institute for the the Transformation of India. Um, welcome. That's a very impressive sounding institution. 
Um, can I invite you please to, to introduce yourself and your work in India? Am I audible to you? Yep, please go ahead. Yes, yes. So, uh, as you are aware, the National Institution for Transformation of India, NITI, what we call, this is primarily an institution which is uh, into a lot of activities, a lot of uh, national transformational activities. And one of the major activities to, prov to provide a kind of policy support and synchronize, orchestrate among so many other ministries, live ministries, which, is, which are there, and to come out with a kind of innovative solutions to so many things. So precisely, I am looking after uh, infrastructure connectivity, and I'm also looking, looking after electric mobility. So that is my sphere. And yes, I am right, all for you. Okay, so um, can you t tell us a little bit what you're doing, um, what measures, what strategies are looking at for the transformation of urban mobility? Yes, you know, as far as uh, if we see the history of urbanization, I mean, in a very short, you see, if we see the last, say, 60 years, now these 60 years can be broken in, can be split in, say, three parts. The initial year when the rural population and the urban population, the gap was, I'm talking of the international, it is the gap was of one billion. Now it is the 2010, around 2010, that is a landmark year because that is the time when the graph crosses each other, it intersects, the lines intersect each other. And precisely now the position is the right reverse where the urban population is one plus than the rural population. So in these 60 years, what we see is precisely that it is, it is just the other way around the things have happened. So the urban population has increased like anything. The same is in India also. And that the moment urban population increases, the direct implication is that it will, it will exert a lot of pressure on connectivity and transport activity. And the moment transport comes in, the fuel is the most important part. And with the fuel emission, and with that, it is linked to the climate. So that is the kind of linkage that we can formulate. OK. And in your work, um, you know, improving fuels, um, you mentioned improving vehicles. Yes, what, exactly. what about shifting? Do you, do you look at shifting transport to other modes as well? Yes, yes. So. If we want to improve upon, say, climate, if we want to meet our commitment to the NDC commitment that we have made at Paris, if we want to reduce the level of pollution, the health externalities, these all factors are in a way linked. That means that the energy source has to be now it has to be transformational. It, ha it has to be changed. It has to be, to be shifted from the conventional fossil fuel to kind of uh, no, I mean, reproducible works, the sources, the renewable sources of energy that has to be done. Now in India, what we have that we are attempting at precisely my jurisdiction is my area is that of electric mobility. So precisely we are now gradually shifting over to uh, uh, we are attempting to shift to kind of uh, uh, and propagate and proliferate as much of uh, uh, electric uh, transportation as possible. And such a solution has to be technology agnostic. It is not precisely what chemistry that you are adopting, but it has to be like that. So in Indian context, if you see, uh, to have little more clarity, then almost close to 200 million tons. Let's say, to be more precise, it is 193.74 million tons 
of petroleum products we are that is our consumption level and if you if i further split this consumption then you will see that the diesel is 43% petroleum is 12% and LPG is liquid petroleum gas is 9%. When I further dive down, when we further dive down, then we find that the 70% of diesel consumption and almost 99.6% of petrol consumption is in a specific sector of transport. And I'm sure this must be the trend in good number of countries. That was the reason why it is seven percent of those who participated at, uh, 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 at Paris, they agreed that yes, transport is one of the major culprits and this needs to be uh, toned down, it needs to be diversified. That was the kind of understanding that developed there. The same is also uh, here also, that understanding is there. And that is the reason why we are trying to proliferate uh, electric mobility as far as possible ensuring that the source is from the renewable sources. That is our approach. Thank you very much. That's um, interesting. Can, can you tell us a little bit the, 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 the barriers you face or the challenges you face in your work and how you, you overcome them? You know, in mobility front, if you see precisely urban mobility, the most significant challenge is that of, I'll use the word orchestrating the mobility. I mean, there are different modes, there are different geographies, there are different population group with their different differing capacity to pay. And you have to create a combination so that all of them are in a position to reach and use without wasting time in infructuous mobility, they are able to reach the destination where they want to. Mm -hmm. So precisely if in one word, if you ask me that I would use the word orchestrating it, I'll give the same example, you know, suppose I'm, you are watching a, an orchestra, so it is precisely the role of that conductor, how he orchestrates between different types of different types of instruments and so many people, so many locations, and then he is able to create that, uh, that symphony. Uh, that is the major challenge in urban transport, how to create that symphony amidst geographies, amidst modes. And, and, and who, in, in urban mobility, who do you see as the, is the conductor? Is this the, the national level, the state level, the, the city level? Who, who do you see as the principal conductor of your mobility orchestra? You know, hello. Mr. Dendi, do you hear us? Yes, I am there, Mr. Student. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes. Uh, no, please, please repeat the question. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so in in this mobility, this orchestration of mobility in India, who, who do you see as the principal conductor? Is this the, the national level, the state level, or the city level for urban mobility? You know, it is at the, all the three levels, precisely. It is all the three levels. Even I would rather add that the municipal authorities, they too have a big role to play. The municipal authorities, they have a role to play. And so does, uh, so is the role of the, uh, at the, at the national level, as well as the uh, state level. But yes, if you are saying that who is the, who is amongst so many different uh, groups, so many different uh, decision makers, who is there to orchestrate? I will simply say that Niti IO is, is performing that role. And uh, that is the reason why a national mission on transformative mobility and battery storage, this has been set up uh, 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 and uh, uh, with the chief executive officer of Niti IO as its chairpersons and as many as seven line ministries with their with their secretaries. They are part of it and they are trying to evolve a system whereby this transformative mobility can be ushered in at the earliest. And whenever I'm using the expression of transformative mobility, please take it 
please take it for granted that it has it will have a very positive impact on the climatic considerations it is going to reduce all our climate concerns I and mean, it is going to address all our climate concerns in a positive way so th th thank you very much thank you very much. I, I, I really regret that we don't have more, more time to exchange i mean i think many people know how crucial your work in india is um, for not only for indians but for protecting the the global climate um, many aspects of what you said we could get into. I mean, particularly this question of how you how you're doing this coordination between the different levels um, would be something that many people will be interested in here. I regret that we can't go into that. Um, but so I, I, I would like to thank you. Um, thank you for this this kind of perspective from from India and, and previously from Argentina. I think this really sets the scene for this thinking about um, national climate plans. Um, we, we, we've heard a lot of that, a bit about this um, this consensus, building consensus, um, aligning different levels of government. Um, you know, the, the dealing with the reality on the ground, the reality of national circumstances, um, uh, transport circumstances, as well as geographical, economic, social realities, and and again, um, making these measures work. I mean, there's a real. And if risk. I can, if I if I can just have a point of mention that GIZ also has a big role to play. We are in fact coordinating with them also so that they are in a position to, uh, to help us make us understand so many things in a better way. Studies which they have conducted on say logistics, urban logistics and transport. We are into such uh, continuous engagement also. Thank you. Great, great. Nice shout out there for, for GIZ, who, who are doing a lot around the world to support mobility in, in many countries, but also helps helps us learn from what you're doing, helps us learn from your experiences to, to improve our work it, work in other countries. So many people will be looking for the, for, forward to those reports and analyses and studies that come out um, from GIZ on your work. So th thank you very much. Um, I need to draw this segment um, to a close. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Um, and now, again, for the audience, um, it's again your turn to get engaged. So we'd like to do another poll on your perspective on, on three particular questions. Um, um, this is a great way for us to crowdsource knowledge and insights. So if we could please switch back to the presentation. And if you can go to menti.com again on your browser, on your phone, menti.com. And this time, the code is 3830. 15.6. I'm sure someone will put that in the chat with the link. menti.com 38.15.6. And, and, and here um, we want to get your assessment of, of, of three dimensions. So first of all, um, do you see decarbonizing transport primary as a, as a governance organizational challenge, orchestrating these actors like we heard from India, building the consensus um, like we heard in Argentina? Or do you see this more as a, a technical challenge about changing fuels, electric mobility, um, uh, those kind of technical solutions? So that's the first, the first dimension. So we try and collect your answers on this. There's over 100 people participating in the session. So we just take that a moment. Okay, we see the answers coming in. Okay, so, um, yeah, strong message there um, towards governance being the primary challenge. Um, this certainly confirms with, with, with my, my experience in working in countries around the world, in China, in Africa, 
Latin America that it's really it's it's really about policies and decisions and power um, um, even more than it is about the, the technology solutions. That's great. Thank you very much for these these insights. Um, I'd now like to go to the second question. Um, how important do you see this multi-stakeholder engagement in effective climate action? So do you see multi-stakeholder engagement as just a lot of talking and a big waste of time? Or is it something that actually you think is actually very important for delivering success? How important is multi-stakeholder engagement? So this is, schools are coming in really quickly so far pretty strong consensus there pretty strong consensus nine out of ten on a scale of not important to very important very good i think this helps us uh, confirm our idea to make this a panel um this is session very much about um the perspectives of different stakeholders okay this is really great um crowdsourcing of information for us um and the third question the last question for the audience is, is linked to this second question. Compared to um, how well are stakeholders being engaged in national climate plans and processes? Is this being done really well? Are you happy with the opportunities you get to, to engage in the process and contribute your knowledge and shape the solutions? Or are you dissatisfied? Is it, is it poor? So remember in the last question, strong consensus, nine out of 10, score for the importance of stakeholder of engagement. Yeah, scores are coming in quickly and we see this is, this is heavily, this is weighted towards the left side. So not very bad, but looks like bad. So here we're seeing a big gap between where as a group you feel it should be and where it actually is. So I think this is a, a great intro to the, to the second half of this session. Um, where we're going to be talking with um, different stakeholders um, uh, on their perspectives. So we're hoping we can contribute in this session to, to bridging this gap. Um, so thank you very much for your scores. Um, remember, um, engage in the chat, send your questions in um, um, on the platform. Um, and all of this material, um, the presentations and the recording, they're all going to be available for you afterwards. So you can use this material again um, with other groups, um, use the links and the knowledge and the insights um, that, that have come up. Um, we'll also be doing um, an outcome of en route to COP26 on Thursday, which will include the highlights um, and a detailed, more detailed report of each session will come later. So um, that will be a resource for you going forward. Um, now, um, all that remains for me to do is to, is to thank you for your attention. I'd like to pass on now um, the moderation to Marion Vedic, who is going to be moderating the, the second part of this session. Thank you very much for your attention. Marion, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, uh, Mark, and uh, a warm welcome from my side. Um, my name is Marion Vedic. Uh, I will be your moderator for the second part of, of this session. I am an independent consultant and I've worked on international climate policy since 2008 um, and since 2014 uh, increasingly worked on transport decarbonization. So I'm quite excited uh, to be here and be given the opportunity to moderate um, this part of the session that brings together those two areas of my work. Um, in this session, we now want to talk about um, the good, the bad, and the ugly of integrating transport into national decarbonization plans. Um, so we're really trying to get a feeling of what is happening on the ground and how well is that integration um, really happening when formulating decarbonization strategies and NDCs. To do this, we ha are now joined by two experts who are working on the ground exactly on that uh, in, in a variety of countries around the world. And I am now welcoming Jan Brion from IDRI and Verena Flues from GIZ. Um, and I will let them introduce themselves um, 
very briefly um, to get a better idea of what they're working on. So Jan, could you please introduce yourself and, and what you're working on? Yes. Thank you, Marion, and hi, everyone. So my, my name is Jan Briand. I'm a climate policy researcher at the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations, which is affiliated to Sciences Po and based in Paris. So this is a, an international policy think tank uh, funded by Laurence Toubiana that you, you may know, and that identifies the, the conditions and propose tools to try to put sustainable development at the heart of international relations and public and private policies. Um, my work is mostly focused on the, the long-term decarbonization trajectories in the transport sector as part of the international research initiative, Deep Decarbonization uh, Pathway. And the idea is to try to build uh, consistent long-term pathways that are able to inform the transport stakeholders and policy decision makers about the possible transformations and action levers, of course. So currently we are working with research teams as you said, in different uh, countries in India, in Indonesia, in South Africa, in Brazil. And we, we just finished a, a first activity in six Latin American countries, so Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, Argentina, Peru, and Ecuador. So concretely, and, and just to, to stop here on my short introduction, um, so we work with a national researcher in more than, than 40 different countries. And for us, these nationally driven uh, topic is very important. I think it's Gustavo that, that said that just before, and, and we fundamentally agree with that. And we try to support uh, them, so this research community, in using a common research methodology to build these long-term pathways for the economy and key subsectors that could be used then for the national policy debate, the national policy debate, in order to inform LTS, uh, so the long-term strategy development, and of course, the short-term action plans and NDCs. Thank you. That's for the introduction. Great. Great. Thanks a lot. I think that that gives a very good context for the discussion. Um, so what is your experience when you're working with these countries um, and when you're discussing ambition of transport decarbonization pathways, especially deep decarbonization pathways in the countries you're working with? Um, especially from what we've just heard, the, the real importance about national focus um, and the importance of governance and, and um, stakeholder engagement. Yeah, no, sure. Uh, actually, the, the topic of the ambition is a really a, a very um, complex discussion. When we engage the discussion on is the ambition enough and is that consistent, uh, with, uh, with the long-term Paris, uh, uh, long-term goal and the Paris Agreement. So we, we start first from what the science says, because it's really uh, the key uh, central in our approach. And I think an important point that is that we used in most of the discussion about ambition is the last 1.5 special report of the IPCC that, that actually explained that the ambition today re require a different nature of action with really profound and structural transformation that linked demand and, and supply and, and the current action. So, and I think the role of demand side solutions consistently articulated, of course, with the supply side are often missed. And we use often this, uh, this discussion about the, 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 the IPCC scenarios and the 1.5 uh, uh, alignment. And what does that change in their current planes and what does that change in terms of ambition and how to better uh, uh, articulate it. The, the second point is I think the, the horizon. We talked a lot about short-term action, about NDC that are like 2030 uh, plane, but to be really consistent with the scientific targets, the long-term uh, objective of 2050, 2070, which is what, what the IPCC said as the horizon to reach the carbon neutrality globally. This is a, a really important lever uh, and also discussion that we engage with countries saying, okay, let's discuss these long-term strategies and your long-term pathway, and let's see where your NDC uh, is exactly on this path. And if it's consistent, and, and you know the different IPCC scenarios that shows that if you delay your action, you will need to have a, a stronger reduction just after. So 
delaying the action is not a good option in, <laughs> in a way. So this is also a good, uh, a good uh, I think, uh, tool to discuss that. And maybe yeah. I just finish on this point on, on stakeholders because I really believe that this is key um, also. What I have seen in different countries is the, the role of front runners, I will say, or the role of uh, positive stakeholders uh, being able to bring some alternative and consistent visions in the debate. I think something that is really difficult uh, in this type of conversation is to try to objectivize a bit uh, the different paths that are possible to reach uh, the, 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 the long-term engagement and to have different stakeholders being able to provide different visions and to enable the discussion of these different visions, the consequences of such action or not. And I think this is, um, this is maybe uh, this discussion on pathway and the condition of realization that is key and where some, what I said, front runners, stakeholders that could be private stakeholders, that could be NGOs, that could be uh, cities that could provide this type of vision and help to also to, to, to discuss and enable a discussion on is the ambition enough in your country? Um, and I think this is a, a really uh, something that we have seen in the, in the, in the policy discussions and, and places. So um, yeah, and, and of course, and ju just to conclude, I think the international context is also very important. And I just stop here, but the last uh, uh, China target uh, for carbon neutrality is clearly a game changer uh, in this type of discussion and also for main emerging economies like in Indonesia or Brazil, being able to have a, a China positioning themselves on that is uh, clearly uh, probably the most effective game changer. <laughs> yeah. Uh I totally agree and I, with and that. I, I don't know if um, yeah, um, I totally agree with that. And I think it's really interesting um, your approach to start with the science and start from the end goal and then see where where the path to that leads and how actual um, targets and NDCs compare to that um, and and then doing that with the wider stakeholder group I think that's that's really important so following up on that it would be interesting to hear from your work that you're doing there um, what do you see exactly how can we concretely do better in that process mm. Mm. Um. Yeah, c concretely, and, and I will uh, use also the presentation of, uh, uh, of Slukat and Mark at the beginning. I think <clears throat> the, the, the first thing that we see is that most of the NDC have no sexual targets and even uh, no, I will say, ASI targets, which means uh, uh, targets on specific, uh, the key main uh, uh, pillars of the decarbonization and activities, st modal structure and, and energy intensity. So first, trying to have a picture on this uh, uh, first disaggregation of targets will be really useful. But even beyond that, even for the countries that could provide the first targets, I often see a, a lake of details in, in putting the right levers of transformation on the table. I mean, talking about modal shift, having an objective on modal shift is good, but it's not enough to create a, an efficient policy and, and to put uh, uh, everyone in movement. So I mean, talking about the real uh, underlying drivers that are the social values as associated to cars or the quality of services that are different or the, the modal cost and the subventions behind and the time of transport. So all these underlying drivers where policy makers could act, this needs to be put in this type of plans because this is what really uh, uh, enables to understand uh, uh, the type of actions that is required to reach, for example, the modal shift uh, transformations. And, uh, and of course, I just mentioned, but in being able to connect that with who can do what and, and, and what is the role of the different stakeholders is, is also something that is uh, uh, lacking in, in most of the, of, the, of the plan. So being able to identify that some actions are not in the hand of the government, but in the hand of the city, in the hand of the private sectors is also very, very key to, to, uh, to understand who should do what and in which direction uh, uh, they, they should advance. And maybe this is maybe, a, um, I think, a, a learnings 
on the, the national participatory processes that we, we have seen. I've, yeah, I would say most of the time we have the feeling that this is running in parallel, I should say, that mm -hmm. the participatory process is not directly used by policy makers to, to define their, their strategy. This is, of course, influencing more or less a bit the content, but this is uh, often working in parallel. And I think that a good question is for uh, policymakers in how to make these participatory processes more useful for them to define the strategy. And, and I think that research and researcher in the different countries could play a big role to try to offer a good ways to structure policy dialogues and offer then a, a, a better uh, stru structure of the discussions that could then feed specific purpose of policymakers. So I really believe that there is a, um, yeah, a, a, a room for improvement, I will say, in the national participatory processes. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's that's very useful insights. And, and I think a lot of people can probably relate to that very much with having the feeling that uh, these um, processes are interesting, but they're not actually influencing the policy making and, and the end result. Um, I now want to hand over to um, Verena, um, who also has great experience um, from her work uh, in, at GIZ in supporting countries in defining transport strategies. So Verena, can you start with a brief introduction of yourself and your role? Um, in GIZ. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Marion, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, uh, my name is Verena Flues. I've been working uh, with GIZ transport projects for the last uh, four years in different areas. Um, and um, I'm, I'm now uh, working for the so called TREX project, which is um, focusing on uh, NDC uh, development, implementation and transport decarbonization strategies in several countries. And uh, among these countries are Kenya, Morocco. We've also been working in Vietnam and the three new partner countries that we're working with are Uganda, Colombia and the Dominican Republic. And so if you think about these countries, you would say, well, but are these the biggest emitters? No, they are not. But what, what they have in common is that they still have very uh, low um, motorization rates, but they're rapidly incre increasing. And so this is exactly our strategy, how to work with this group of countries that still have the chance to influence um, their trajectories and to kind of uh, avoid this um, pathway that our other countries have already taken. And so what we do is to support them um, develop their NDCs and then also um, uh, translate these NDCs into, into more comprehensive strategies. Great, thanks. Um, I think that's a very good point about um, working with countries that are not the big emitters um, because they would become the big emitters tomorrow if we if we don't help them to stop that. Um, and, and the cost for changing um, their systems now is probably a lot less than um, if, if we wait till they've uh, moved down the wrong path. So uh, from these experiences that you have, what would you see as essential for integrating transport better into national decarbonization strategies? Mm -hmm. So I think that there, there are many aspects to it, but um, one point that I really want to, to make here is that we are working at the same time with the ministries that are re responsible for climate change mitigation, so mostly environmental ministries and um, transport ministries. And this is because um, we have this kind of separation of tasks. We have the environmental ministries that are responsible for overall climate strategies that are participating in international negotiations and that are involved in these processes. And, but at the same time, they not necessarily have the expertise in transport. 
So they are overseeing the whole environmental uh, plans, but they might not be so well informed about technology choices, about infrastructure investment, etc. And at the same time, we have the transport ministries that are developing all the long term transport strategies, but that most of the times don't have expertise in climate change because traditionally that has not been their role. They have been working on infrastructure investment and their constituencies traditionally uh, transport operators, logistic enterprises, operators of infrastructure. So they feel more accountable to this constituency than to the climate constituency. So, so many times these two uh, government uh, agents don't work together and we try to bring them together and make them understand each other and especially work these, with these transport ministries so that they create this understanding of what it means to work on climate strategies and to help them um, develop good NDCs and then uh, and I think this is, is very important also have them together with them a look at the numbers because very often we we know that transport has a large share in the national uh, emissions, but we don't know where these emissions come from, whether it's the freight sector, it's the urban transport sector, whether which sector this is and how they're distributed. So we look at the trajectory of the emissions and then we see how they are distributed and what are the most let's say the, the, the options for them, the options of measures with the greatest impact so that they ideally pick the measures that will also have have a good impact on climate mm -hmm. and um, finally and I think this is one of the most important parts is then once you have this NDC and once you have this target it doesn't mean that you have a pathway in the strat strategy so you have your goal but how do you get there and I think there it becomes more complex and and a lot have, has already been, already been said on, on involvement of actors, on consensus building, and I would say mainstreaming within the transport ministries so that it's not only the small union or unit that is working on climate change, but that this work is translated into all the other plans that are developed in the ministry and in other ministries and on this in the subordinate uh, agencies so that we don't have a climate strategy on the one hand and then we have an infrastructure infrastructure investment plan that is going into the opposite direction so we have to translate this into the national the national plans strategies and especially into investment so that this this ndc and this long term commitment is kind of triggering down to the different decision on different levels so I think this is, is, this is the hard work that needs to be done um, and we're working on that. But of course it, it demands a lot because the system is not yet running, I would say in this direction automatically. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that's, that's really interesting. And, and I think what you're alluding to in terms of understanding where emissions actually come from that also points to um, a lack of data and a lack of information in many countries um, that don't have that kind of those kinds of information systems in place that gives them that information um, so along the lines of that what do you think are the largest barriers that you're facing in in your work and that you're observing in your interactions with the countries mm. Yes, so um, so you, you mentioned like two of them. So one is of, of course data, and this is one, one aspect we are focusing our work on because we need this information basis. Of course, governance and inter-institutional coordination, as I said, because we have many different players and we have to create kind of a vision, a shared vision among them. But then I would also like to point to one aspect that we do not tend to focus so much on because we speak a lot about the do's, what we need to do. So for example, uh, investing in electric mobility and uh, investing in, in, in new transport um, uh, options. But I think we also have to talk and there we're coming to the bad and the ugly about the down, don'ts. Because um, 
if you want to have coherent strategies, and if we want to really go this direction of decarbonization, we also have to stop doing some things that are currently done. So for example, uh, uh, looking at national budgets and seeing how budget is allocated and how much of the spending is still going into carbon intensive infrastructure. Because we know yeah. that if it is spent like this, we have this kind of lock in for the next 20 or 30 years. Another aspect that I would like to mention are fossil fuel subsidies. Um, it's a very difficult topic, but we know that only the G G20 uh, is, is spending more than 77 billion on fossil fuel subsidies. So as long as we don't manage to eliminate the subsidies, we still have incentives into going uh, this, this carbon intensive pathway. So I think there are much more ex uh, examples of, of this kind of, of contradictory measures. And um, I don't want to go too deep, but I think what we need to do is to do the right things, but also be coherent and, and stop doing the wrong things. And this yeah, is I, much more difficult because yeah. you have political opposition to it. Yeah, I, I think that's a very, very important point. And uh, I think uh, I would very much like to hear Jan's um, take, especially on that last part, but in general, uh, on the observations that you raised, maybe Jan, you want to react to that? Yeah, I, th <clears throat> I think I, I see um, an, a major challenge that, that you mentioned, Verena, that is, a, that is a quite interesting and that I am also uh, seeing and discussing a lot in, uh, in my different, um, different activities currently, is these uh, structural transformations and pathways that could be different uh, for the emerging economies. How the, how the path could not obligatory follow the same path than, than what the developed countries, for example, have experienced without uh, being against development. And I think this is a, a key topic that I often discuss and see this opposition, of course, between you know, development and, for example, managing what I will call managing the kilometers or managing the distance. And, and we often um, discuss it because trying also to reframe what means uh, demand of mobility. Where does that come from exactly? Uh, people are not doing kilometer for fun. Uh, they are doing kilometer to access to activities. And I think being able to engage, and this is quite difficult, this discussion on actually we can have a think and we can discuss a bit this projection that are sometimes just based on, on the GDP projection, you know, <laughs> on this demand and try to discuss a bit more in detail what is the type of mobility that could be different uh, maybe, and this is directly linked to one of your uh, major comments that, uh, for me that you have said about human settlement, urbanization, transport infrastructure, all these major infrastructure that will be built uh, and that are still in a really strong and fast development currently in the country you mentioned and in the country I, I am working with. Uh, this is clearly key because if they change the way they, 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 they built this type of infrastructure, thinking at the mobility behind, thinking at the access of activities and not the fact uh, that people will do kilometers. The, the, the purpose is not the kilometer, but the access to activities. Yeah. We can discuss the fact that development could be done in reducing the kilometers, and that is not in opposition. And I think this is one of the key, key uh, uh, challenge that I see in most of the developing countries that I work with, these challenges are no, no, the, the you know, kilometer mobility is seen as a, a, a development uh, aspect. And I said, yes, access to activities is a development. Mm -hmm. Doing kilometers is not a development. I see people that do in Paris 20 kilometers or more, 30 kilometers every morning to go to work. This is not something positive. They, if they could do only one kilometer to go to work, they will be happier. So yeah. how to improve that? And I think they have the opportunity, as you said, to think that from scratch and, and to better organize this uh, yeah. human settlement, urbanization and infrastructure that could change completely the path that they will follow in the next 20 years. So I think it will be my 
uh, yeah, my largest comment on, on your on all what you have said, but uh, the one I pick. Yeah, I, I think that points to what you were saying before um, that we need to be a bit more balanced with the, the different pillars of activities. Um, so not just focus on technology fix solutions at the tailpipe, but also think about activity, reducing activity and reduce, uh, and then shifting to other modes. We actually do have an interesting question in the chat um, where um, one of the participants would like to know what your um, experiences are from um, previous efforts to decarbonize such as CDM, which dramatically failed in transport sector, um, but also initial carbon trading in NAMAS. Um, so uh, very, very short yeah. uh, reflections on that, really only like 30 seconds. <laughs> yes, so I can't really say anything on CDM. I know there has been some guidance on how to develop these projects, but I know they're very difficult. For NAMAS, we, we do have a, a lot of different NAMAS pro NAMA projects that are working out quite well. And I will look for the documentation afterwards so that you, I, I can share this with the participants. But there are transport NAMAS, especially in the urban sector, that are working. Great. Uh, Jan, any? No, and any uh, any additional comments? Actually, at the same CDM, I've not I've not uh, uh, followed in depth. I have seen NAMAS in some uh, in some countries that actually works. I, I would say, and and so I I don't have the 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 critic or the the negative comments on on the issues. So uh, I, okay. I would not add anything. That's that's fine. Um, so to close, um, we would um, invite Verena to tell us about. Um, six policy recommendations that GIZ has developed to help policymakers to enhance action towards decarbonizing the sector. So, Verena, over to you. Yes, so I will be very brief on that and I would just invite you to, to download the publication, have a look yourself. So this has been developed, especially with this idea to uh, provide more ideas and, 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 and guidance to national policymakers. Um, so these um, six recommendations are structured. Um, we have the goal, we have the policy, we have the milestones and partners and technology. So these are the categories among, uh, along which we are organizing all these six recommendations. And as you see, they focus on, on different aspects that are all of equal um, importance referring to the overall uh, overarching goal as the first uh, recommendation, uh, urban mobility, um, the second um, um, resilience and climate adaptation, um, investment in sustainable freight and infrastructure, and finally electrification. So they are co coherent and consistent with the SLOCAT um, campaign. So these they're actually building on each other. And so if you want to dig a, a little bit deeper in, in what, it, or what it means to actually decarbonize transport with all its different elements and, and facets, you can, you can have a look and, and, and go a little bit beyond of what we could you know, touch upon very briefly, just mentioning different areas. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Verena, and also thanks a lot to Jan for um, your interventions and uh, the interesting discussion. Um, I think it it sort of um, almost repeated some of the points that we heard in the earlier session about the need for um, stakeholder engagement, um, but we also heard um, some interesting uh, reflections on the need for um, information and uh, science and robust analysis that actually informs this dialogue between stakeholders. And I think that's also an, an important takeaway. Um, so thanks to both of you. And um, we will now move on to the next panel. Um, Thank you, Marion. Thank you very much. Which um, then 
now deals with um, how we can actually strengthen transport contribution in NDCs, in, in future rounds of NDC revisions um, from the perspective of various stakeholders. And um, I'm very happy that we have um, a very interesting and diverse panel. Uh, and I would invite um, Ms. Lucy Anderton, who is um, Head of Sustainability um, at the International Union of Railways, with obviously a perspective from, from uh, rail, but also from a union. So um, that's from the workers' perspective, which will be right, quite interesting. Then we have uh, Mrs. Hannah Murdoch, who's project manager and analyst at REN21, um, looking more from the um, renewable energy perspective and the nexus between renewable energy and transport. Uh, we also have Mr. Nicolas Beaumont, who's Senior Vice President of Sustainable Development and Mobility at the Michelin Group. And we have Mrs. Rita Roy Chaudhuri, who's Assistant Secretary General at the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. So um, quite diverse um, perspectives. And I would um, now ask um, Mrs. Lucy Anderton to um, introduce herself and your work. And um, then we will um, briefly discuss uh, on what you see as the role of railways in decarbonizing transport, um, both on the passenger and the freight side. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um... Thank you for welcoming us uh, this afternoon to join in these really interesting discussions. Um, I say um, I work for the International Union of Railways, which is um, the voice, voice of the global railway sector. So we have over 200 members uh, over 100 different countries globally um, uh, that convenes the railways um, on sort of technical point of view, um, but to really um, promote rail as a obviously a fantastic uh, sustainable form of transport. So. Um, I lead the sustainability team um, and help uh, convene the uh, sustainability experts across the rail industry, um, uh, as well as working um, uh, with uh, lots of other associations to, to um, consider how we can, um, rail can be part of that sustainable uh, mobility solutions. Um, yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so as I say, what, what would you see as the role of rail in that transformation? Mm, yeah, I mean, um, we see the railway really is, was central to the first industrial revolution. Um, and we've seen rail, railways being central to this, this third, this, this um, hopefully green industrial revolution that we're sort of uh, on the brink of. Um, you know, we, we heard earlier about the, sort of the growth of the significance of transport's share of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we also know how urgent it is to make that step towards decarbonisation. So we really see rail as sort of the quickest way to really significantly um, reduce uh, transport emissions through that shift um, to, uh, to rail um, and other forms of public transport, really, to um, uh, because we're already largely electrified um, network um, and by design energy efficient, land use efficient. Um, and so really it makes sense um, to focus on, on shifting transport um, uh, modal share towards rail. Um, and so we really see the railway as being that kind of backbone to um, uh, sustainable mobility. Um, yeah. So, so what do you, see as the uh, key change that is needed to accelerate that modal shift to, to rail? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you could ask why, why, then why are we only, I think at the moment, about 8% of the modal share of, of transport activity at the moment. Um, but I think a lot of it uh, comes down to the last mile. So it's about that, how, how well connected we are to other forms of transport. So I think one of the biggest significant transformations we can make is becoming much more interconnected with a really broad range of different um, sustainable forms of mobile transport. And we can become that hub 
um, whether that's at cities or if that's at ports um, for freight or passengers, we can, we can be that uh, intermodal hub for a whole range of different sustainable forms of transport. So I think it's really about much deeper collaborative relationships with other mobility providers um, and, um, and, and making use of, for example, the digital platforms that are available um, in making mobility as a service. Um, so we, and, and actually it comes down to just providing a fantastic customer experience. Um, and so that it is not only easy, but also just desirable. Um, so a service that is inclusive and accessible, comfortable, reliable, affordable, um, you know, so it's, it, it is the sort of best option to go for. And that's, so that's the biggest thing that the railway sector itself it can do um, to make that transformation. So th that's a good point, and I think that ties in nicely with what we heard before from India about this orchestrating uh, the transport system and, mm -hmm. and making rail an, an interesting and desirable part, um, also for freight, I, I would hope. Mm -hmm. um, and making that a good experience is certainly partly uh, the responsibility of the sector, but what would you say does the sector need from the governments to mm -hmm. go faster in that? direction yeah well i mean i would echo lots of thoughts from the the fireside discussion that you've had earlier which was really interesting about the kind of things that uh, governments need to uh, help start addressing it's it's having those really clear targets uh, time bound understood and we know what the policy is um, so that it's a real clear message i think to the industry including our manufacturers uh, of rolling stock as well as our operators our infrastructure managers um, so we all we all know, and then as along with other mobility providers, we 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 know what the target is, uh, we know what the expectation is, um, and then a policy and, a, and particularly a fiscal policy uh, that backs that up and supports that shift to public transport and to rail freight. Um, so tips that balance um, in terms of the we're talking about the subsidies and the bailouts that are still really there and um, supporting um, uh, other other industries and, and forms of transport. Um, more than the more sustainable ones. So it's that kind of contradictory policy that um, yeah. really needs to be transformed. So it's, and it's kind of taking into account those kind of environmental and social costs that the less sustainable modes of transport perhaps don't always um, have within their, uh, the cost at the point of, of use. Um, and having that real adequate um, um, investment into innovation as well. So um, using the sort of stimulus packages that, you know, trillions of dollars that are being spent at the moment to really invest in improving public transport systems and uh, innovative ways to make that customer experience so great that we need. Yeah, yeah I think that ties with what Verena said about shifting the investment flows in the budgets uh, for, for transport ministries. Mm -hmm. And we also heard Argentina before speak about the need to combine rail and, and road better and integrate better, for, especially for freight um, and especially for large countries with, with long, very long distances. Um, so where freight makes mm -hmm. so much more sense on, on rail than on roads but absolutely uh, and it's that international yeah. picture as well with freight of course and making the making our borders as smooth as possible so yes. that so that uh, international freight as well as international passenger high-speed rail can be as smooth as possible as well great thanks a lot i think that was really interesting and we'll get back to a second round where he can share some more reflections i now want to hand over to uh, mrs hannah murdoch from uh, the renewable energy network for the 21st century. Um, can you introduce yourself and your work? And, um, and REN21 just published a report that discusses um, the nexus of transport, road transport and renewable energy. And maybe you could share some of the main messages from that. Right. Yeah, uh, thanks, Marion. Um, so I'm, I'm Hannah Murdoch. I'm coordinating the work on energy policy and on transport in the REN21 research direction team based at UNEP in Paris. REN21 is the renewable energy policy network for the 21st century and is only global community of renewable and energy actors bringing together multiple stakeholders from science, academia, governments, NGOs, 
and industry, among others, and we're providing uh, the most up-to-date figures and analysis on global developments in the sector with the goal of encouraging a rapid shift to renewables-based energy system. Um, so to answer your question about this report, um, to start off, what we already know is that the transport sector is far from being on track to meeting the global climate targets, as many uh, panelists have already mentioned. And despite gains in energy efficiency, particularly in road transport, global energy demand in the sector has increased steadily over the past decade. And this is due mostly to the growing number and size of vehicles on the world's roads. A rapid shift uh, is needed to meet the climate objectives clearly, but with actors in both the energy and transport sectors working together. And so we find this missing in many instances. So to that end, REN21 teamed up with the FIA Foundation to do an in-depth study that was just released called the Renewable Energy Pathways in Road Transport. And as part of this process, we brought together a diverse community of uh, experts, thought leaders, and industry champions from both the energy and transport sectors to come together with the primary goal of bridging the two communities in the context of decarbonization pathways for the transport sector, uh, focusing on road transport. So in the report, we identified five overarching guidelines for action, each requiring cross-sectoral collaboration, um, first, to define a national long-term roadmap for energy and transport uh, system decarbonization, to enhance collaboration between energy and transport sectors and ensure a multi-level governance for the implementation of renewable energy solutions, tailoring policy instruments to effectively implement the energy transport roadmap, improving cross-sectoral knowledge, dialogue, and awareness, between the renewable energy and transport communities and developing tools for assessing context specific challenges and solutions. And finally, REN21, the FIA Foundation and SLOWCAT are actually going to build on this momentum created in this process and take the work forward with joint initiatives to further bring together energy and transport actors and experts. Uh, so I'd encourage um, everyone listening in to go to our website, REN21.net to download the report and really get into the details and also sign up on the report page on our website to stay informed about developments and how to get involved. Great, thanks a lot. Um, I think that ties in very nicely with what we've heard so far about the need for um, discussion and dialogue and, and understanding each other and also um, seeing the other perspectives and understanding very much the local context. Um, of where we're working in. In that context, what would be your message to governments and other actors so we can advance this topic of renewable energy in, in the transport sector in the context of the NDCs? Right, so um, the clearly the, the various policies and targets may vary from country to country based on these, these local contexts and um, urban versus non-urban, um, et cetera. But uh, I think from a starting point, addressing the transport energy demand is key as it's growing much faster than any other end use sector. Um, the transport sector still relies almost entirely on fossil fuels and has by far the lowest share of renewables among end use sectors. Um, the transport sector represents nearly a third of total vital energy consumption and only 3.7% of this is met by renewables. And there's a lot of talk about electrification uh, but currently just over 1% of transport energy demand is met by electricity and only a quarter of that electricity is based on renewable sources. So this has clearly resulted in a global rise in emissions from the sector, um, reaching nearly a quarter of global energy related emissions. And even if all the policy measures that are currently announced are implemented, the sector is expected to increase emissions by 60% to 2050. Um, so I think uh, governments have to finally realize that the, the transport and energy sectors are tightly interlinked and that the strategies have to be aligned with the communities working together. Um, what's clear, though, is that renewables have to play a fundamental role in the, the transport systems of the future and that work should start on that now. Uh, should have started yesterday. Um, 
And the, uh, in addition to the previously mentioned guidelines for action in this renewable energy pathways for road transport report um, that you can find on our website, I would think government should also think about emissions from um, well to real and not just on tailpipe emissions with renewable based transport also being used in public transports and fleets as public procurements can be used as a starting point to create demand. Governments can also think about renewable energy as um, being equal to energy security and increased resilience as this would mean fewer energy imports and relying on domestic renewable energy sources. Um, because we know that renewable power now is the least cost option globally among renewable energy sources. Um, as yeah. I've already mentioned, the, that more integrated planning is needed across sectors. And in terms of policy integration, either strong renewable energy and transport decarbonization can happen concurrently, or they can be integrated around energy or CO2 targets and policies defined for these end use sectors. Um, and right. finally, the solutions clearly also need to be part of a broader effort to reduce the overall transport energy demands by promoting non-motorized transport and other best practices under the avoid shift and improve framework. Thanks a lot, Tana. Um, I think the, um, the increasing collaboration between the energy side and the, the transport side was already um, very nicely um, highlighted uh, by um, Gustavo in, in, with the example of Argentina, where he said he talks to his energy counterpart um, on a daily basis. And that's an encouraging um, example. Um, unfortunately, not widely replicated yet. Um, so I think that's, that's a good um, message that, that this needs to um, increase. So um, thanks a lot, Hannah. And, and um, I welcome uh, Mr. Nicolas Beaumont, who um, could please introduce yourself and your work. And it would be really interesting for the audience to understand why Michelin is so engaged in transport decarbonization. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear myself? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Okay. Very well. So, Marian, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very, very happy to be with to be with you. Uh, so, I'm in charge of sustainable development and sustainable mobility for the Michelin Group. And you know, I'm sure that Michelin is a mobility company for more than a hundred years. And sustainable development means all the aspects: social, societal, and environmental. And when we talk about sustainable mobility, we rely on the definition given by Sum for All, that is one of the organizers of COP20, our route to COP26, that is mobility that would be green, efficient, accessible, and safe. And these are the four pillars we are working on. So first, before we go back to why is Michelin so much involved in, in decarbonization of the transport sector, I think it's interesting to reflect on what has been said before. We talked a lot about the NDCs. And you see that behind the NDCs of the country, there's a narrative, there's a strategy. But the product and services that are going to fill this strategy, globally, they come from companies, be it public or private companies. And that's where, you know, we talked a lot in the, in, in the last survey about co-construction, cooperation, multi-stakeholder dialogue. The question is, how do you organize that? So there is first a very simple way to look at it. Countries have got their NDCs. And in parallel to these NDCs, you've got science-based target. That is an initiative from WWF, IEA, and WRI that is setting targets for companies in line with the Paris Agreement. So you, you could say, OK, it's fine. You've got NDCs, and uh, countries do their own job. And then you have uh, science-based targets and companies do what they have to do. In reality, that's not the way it's going to work because as we have said, everything is intertwined. So it's key to create this dialogue. And why has Michelin been involved in this dialogue from the very beginning? It's very simple. Is that mobility is a need for human progress because it's access to food, access to jobs, access to culture, access to friends. 
But if mobility doesn't become sustainable, it's impossible, it's not acceptable. So that's why we need to do everything we can to make it safer, greener, more efficient and more accessible. And to do that, public and private sector need to work together. But before they can work together, they must understand each other. And that's why having initiatives like the Transport Decarbonization Alliance that we are part of, Sustainable Mobility for All, ITF, International Transport Forum with the Corporate Partnership Board, the fact that the UN created the ACT initiative and we are and moving on is part of the component four of ACT. All this enables contact between public, private, companies, NGOs, the, the cities, everybody. But then once you do that, you understand each other much better. You understand the vocabulary, but it doesn't mean that you're going to move from ambition to action. And by the way, from ambition to action is the motto of moving on that is a transport ecosystem that Mishnah created and is inspiring. Now, if you look at what we are doing now, Mishnah, for instance, is involved in the TDA. We are one of the organizers of En Route to COP26. And I'm very proud to be at the steering committee. We, for instance, we've got a community of interest on urban freight. And this community of, uh, of interest on urban freight puts together cities, countries, and companies working together to come up with real solution, real pilots. Sustainable mobility for all that is led by the World Bank and I also have the honor of being at the steering committee. We uh, work at the global roadmap of action, trying to look at what are the public policies that are enabling sustainable mobility. And then we said we need to move from ambition to action. So that's why at the moment we're working on South Africa and for South Africa, we are working with the Southern Africa Development Bank and many uh, organizations that are part of the Central Consortium to define with them the right public policies that will enable them to move towards sustainable mobility, towards uh, decarbonized mobility, and towards better NDCs. We've done the same with SLOCAT for the last years, and I'm sure Rita Chaudhuri, who is going to speak after, after, after me, I think we'll talk about it. Roadmaps, decarbonization roadmaps for countries. And how do you do that? You do that, that put, we're putting people together, and it's what Rita did with FIKI. We published with SLOCAT a uh, decarbonization roadmap un, uh, uh, under the name of PPMC, Paris Process on Mobility and Climate, showing a methodology and for instance, India applied this methodology. We've applied also this methodology to Ivory Coast and uh, we are going to do it for Senegal. And it's where countries, cities, companies can work together to give elements to countries in order that they create NDC that makes sense, that incorporate transport in the right way and where the technical solutions that exist already today in BRICS can be put together in line with the regulations, the policies, and the whole infrastructure. So uh, I, I, I think that's what's very important at the moment, the BRICS exist, you've got policies, you've got technical solutions, you've got idea of infrastructure. How do you put this together through multi-stakeholder dialogue and really activating real actions? And that's why all these initiatives, TDA, Some for All, uh, ACT, Moving On, most of them being, uh, uh, partners of this event today are key for dialogue and the movement towards action. Yeah, that that's that's interesting, and that's it's nice that you already mentioned how you translate this international, uh, more general um, approach to the actual national context, which mm -hmm. is what we heard this morning, is really crucial for for uh, defining um, strategies that actually work in the context of the and, country. And if I may, Marianne, that's also why the Michelin Foundation is funding IDRI, for instance, for the decarbonization pathways, because very clearly helping countries to develop their narrative, deciding yeah. on in which way they want to go. Is it multimodal? Is it more train? Is it more road? Is it more uh, maritime? Is key to then develop the investments that are needed and also the technical solutions. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so as a sort of um, wrapping up message, what would you say 
what would be your message to national governments as they're preparing their NDCs? What can they do to help companies and the private sector to scale up action on transport decarbonization? What I would say is engage in uh, engage in multi-stakeholder dialogue. It might seem complicated. The words used by companies are not the same as the word used by cities or countries, but the global enrichment is key because then you come up with, this, with a strategy that is feasible and where each stake, uh, stakeholder is helping the other. So that would be really my recommendation. And I've seen it in, in several countries, you know, in India, the way FIKI is involved and Rita is going to talk about it into the NDC Commission of India, I think is extremely interesting. But we have the case also in many other countries in the world. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think that was very, very uh, helpful and interesting. And um, as you so nicely already introduced, let's move on to uh, Ms. Rita Reuter Jury. Um, and maybe you can introduce yourself quickly and, um, and tell us about that roadmap that we've already heard about. Thank you, Marian. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, thank you. I am uh, the Assistant Secretary General in the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. It is India's apex industry body. Uh, we work across different sectors of the economy. We have 76 verticals and we work with business and industry uh, across the board. Uh, we are also very closely working on policy advocacy. That is our prime role, uh, very closely with the government. And uh, as Nicola mentioned, uh, you know, we, uh, we are also part of various government committees, one of them being the NDC Implementation Committee and other uh, different committees on, on, on energy and uh, other areas. Uh, working very closely. My role uh, encompasses uh, different portfolios of uh, climate change, sustainable mobility, sustainable finance, uh, environment, uh, renewable energy, uh, power and coal, as well as water and sanitation. So very, very broad based, but sustainable mobility is one of the key areas that I'm working on. Great, thanks. Uh, yes. Uh, so, Marian, just to uh, tell you about the, the roadmap that Fiki embarked on, as Nicola mentioned. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, uh, Fiki actually uh, uh, engaged in, uh, in the whole process of developing an India roadmap on low carbon and sustainable mobility, uh, focusing on transport sector decarbonization. And uh, this was done in partnership with the PPMC, uh, with uh, WWF India and the Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. It was more close to almost two years uh, a process driven by a multi-stakeholder engagement, pan-India consultations, and uh, close uh, you know, discussions with business think tanks, uh, different actors on the ground, as well as policymakers. We launched the India Roadmap in June of this year and uh, got, uh, you know, it was acknowledged by the government, uh, uh, the Honorable Minister of Transport and Highways, uh, Mr. Nitin Gadkari himself launched the India Roadmap uh, that Fiki uh, published in June of this year. So uh, just to tell you a bit about the roadmap, it is of course, uh, as Nicola mentioned, aligned to the global roadmap and its eight components, but we did of course customize it to the Indian context, uh, you know, to, to factor in national circumstances and, uh, and uh, the uniqueness of the Indian context. So uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, the key messages that I would say there were certain uh, very important messages that came out. Firstly, I would like to say that, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, the global climate dialogue is very much emphasizing on the role of non-state actors in, in, in supporting the state actors, not just to build a narrative, but also to support in building the action plan and strategies. So on those lines, uh, the the uh, India roadmap focused on eight components uh, on urban transformation, on low carbon energy supply, on improving intermodal and intramodal system efficiencies, 
on optimizing supply chains for freight emissions and avoiding vehicle kilometers on providing low carbon solutions for rural population, uh, focusing on adaptation and uh, last but not the least, uh, deployment of economic instruments. So some of the key messages that really emerged at the end of all these, uh, you know, pan-India consultations that we had uh, is first and foremost that there is a need to rebuild the governance structures, which is really going to be central to integrated planning at both the city and state levels. We heard uh, Mr. Sinha from Niti Aayog also mention this, that there needs to be a symphony and well-orchestrated mechanism uh, for mobility, uh, and, and that's very, very true in the Indian context. Um, and, and most important to the governance structure, what the India Roadmap emphasizes, is the need to empower uh, what we call uh, UMTA, which is the Unified Metropolitan Transport Authority. So the need to empower and give a, largest, uh, a larger role to a unified authority at the city level, which would be responsible for allocating funds, for planning, for operating, and for adopting different kinds of mobility systems. So an integrated approach starting right at the city level. The second most important message that the India Roadmap gave is that there is a need for a paradigm shift from building infrastructure to moving vehicles and uh, to building infrastructure to moving people. So from moving vehicles to moving people is what should be the, uh, the central focus. And therefore it's important to build a framework that will capture different externalities of each mode of transport and look at an optimal intermodal mix. The third important message was the need to incentivize uh, usage of vehicles rather than ownership of vehicles and to incentivize more of public transportation in urban and rural areas. So there were there are different sort of different uh, granular recommendations under each of these larger messages of the India Roadmap. The fourth important message uh, was about integrating multiple modes of transport for people and goods for seamless mobility. I think that is very, very critical in terms of how people can, and because the paradigm shift has to be to move people rather than move vehicles, it's important to also see integration of multiple modes of transport for people and goods. And, and therefore adoption of intelligent transport systems, et cetera. Uh, the fifth message is around transit-oriented development and last mile connectivity. I think the speakers in the earlier segment spoke about the fact that, you know, why do you need to travel long distances to work? So transit-oriented development and last mile connectivity is extremely important. Uh, the need to incentivize use of sustainable fuels, I think that is absolutely central to how different, uh, you know, fuel shift can happen in the context of mobility. And uh, of course, uh, one of the important things that the India Roadmap uh, looked at, which is often overlooked in transport planning, is the need to integrate climate adaptation aspects into both urban and transport planning. Uh, and lastly, of course, to look at economic instruments to facilitate the transition to low carbon and sustainable transport options. One of the key messages also was around promoting research into new and advanced technologies. And now we see uh, at the India level, there is a, there is a lot of focus on, on building a hydrogen-based economy, uh, hydrogen fuel cells, and also uh, looking at alternatives to battery technologies moving beyond lithium ion batteries. So these were uh, some of the key messages what we do see from the India Roadmap learning is that there is a need for government, private sector, and other stakeholders to work together in a concerted manner. I think uh, the, the poll that was the quiz that was done uh, earlier uh, is, is uh, you know, shows how people think around this and that partnerships are extremely important. Engagement with different stakeholders is critical uh, to uh, building a robust and integrated planning for the country. 
Uh, and 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 just by way of uh, the other thing that I wanted to say in terms of alignment with the global roadmap is that we also looked at the India roadmap from our near term, which is 2022, uh, uh, short term 2030, and a long term 2050 horizon. And uh, while most of the action is in the near term, and of course a large part of the action will lie in the medium term. For the long term, the India roadmap really points to more of strategic long term direction and larger focus on research and development. Great. So, Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think that was that was very, very insightful and ties very nicely with what we've already heard also from uh, Jan about needing to have the long term perspective, um, but then looking at what you can do uh, in the meantime. And it was also interesting to hear um, already the, the need for new governance structures um, that uh, enable this orchestrating that we've we've heard before. Um, so that already points to a lot of um, need for also national governments to get involved and, and, and uh, create the right frameworks, both on the governance, but also on the incentive side, as you mentioned. I now want to um, go uh, for a second round um, to each panelist to give everybody the chance to also react to each other's points and, and, um, and see, um, what additional observations you have ever after having heard um, the other intervention. So um, I would ask all the panelists from this round to unmute themselves and um, maybe we can um, start with Lucy and um, maybe your your um, reflections after after all your colleagues interventions. Uh, yeah, I think I'd, I'd like to pick up mostly um, on Hannah's point about about the connection between energy and transport, which I think is is really interesting and um, something that railways haven't uh, um, recently um, haven't been brilliant at. But I think more and more we're starting to see how railways can recognising their role in the renewable energy um, uh, revolution, and and so how they they're starting to. Um, uh, create, uh, you know, develop and invest in their own renewable um, uh, sources of, of, of energy. So we're seeing um, uh, infrastructure owners um, investing in their own solar farms or, or wind farms and, and energy storage as well in, in the line side land that they have. So it's uh, it's really interesting to see how they could be kind of part playing a part in that in that renewable investment. Um, and, and making sure that they they are part of creating the you know uh, supplying that demand um, and and providing some real um, I suppose resilience in the in their own sort of energy um, supply as well. Yeah, I, I think that's that's interesting because it changes sort of the almost the job description of different types of of entities and operators where they classically only provided a certain transport service and now they they can they can actually start thinking to being an energy provider themselves yeah, that's because of the the collaborations they can they can set up with people who are experts at this and yeah. so and uh, i know if you've ever heard of an organization called riding sunbeams in the uk they're a community funded community based uh, you know local energy providers but are actually feeding in um, solar energy into the directly into the overhead lines for for um, and they've just done that in a in a sort of trial um, proof of concept but they've they've got investment to expand that so it's actually through collaboration with people who are really good at this um, uh, well we're really good at running railways we, you know we can form those links with people that are really good at uh, delivering renewable energy Great. Hannah, would you um, want to react to that directly? Because it directly impacts um, your area of expertise. Yeah, I would, I mean, echo that. I think that the the rail sector and, I mean, is already in a, in a good position to have this link with renewable electricity. It's already the, the, the most electrified um, sector in transport. Uh, and I guess also touching on, um, 
Rita's example in India, that there's the, the Delhi example of um, their rail being powered with PV. And I know that this has been a, a used as an, a model elsewhere. Um, and there are several private sector examples of this uh, already being integrated. Um, but the same thing is happening also with uh, car sharing companies um, and, and new mobility services directly purchasing electric, uh, renewable electricity. Uh, so it's not, it's, I mean, it can go across the, the board. The, the possibilities are endless for linking and um, increased renewable electricity. Nicolas, any any further reflections on you? I, I think it would be really interesting also to tie this back to the NDCs and what that can, mm. how that can help, or how the stakeholders, the process can help the NDCs and the other way around. Mm -hmm. So I, I think just to remark, we, we 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 talked about everything that has got to be done, and we talked a little bit about the financing, and also about the value sharing model. And that's something extremely important that we need to work together because what is the business model? When we, we talked about car sharing, mobility as a service, etc., who gets the money? Who gets some money? Who creates the value? You had the question about also energy, you know, a renewable energy that is purchased directly. So how do you share when it's electricity? Where does the state get the tax? And all this ties back to the NDC. Because NDC, I'm telling a nice story. If you don't know how to fund it and where the value comes from and who gets it, it's not going to be implemented. And that's, I think it's where the link is to, to recreate a complete model of value creation and value sharing between public and private and the user. So you've got the user, public, private, and how do we reorganize all this? And we've seen, for instance, for electricity, at least uh, in the Western countries, the big question is, you know, we have a lot of tax on fuels. When you switch to electricity, how do you manage it? What is the system? And then who gets the money, who doesn't get it anymore? And how do you create the equilibrium? Yeah, I think that's a good point because it, it we're always talking about transport system and we need to take the system view, usually meaning we need to look at all modes. We need to look at mm -hmm. the interaction between modes. But we also need to look at the broader system and one element is we need to look at the energy system that's the renewable energy part and and how where does the energy come from but it's true it also connects to the fiscal system. Yes. What kinds of um, tax implications mm -hmm. income implications does that have um, for the countries. Um, and depending on the type of tax you put the country will, uh, is going to push one technical solution or the other. And so that's why it's extremely important to find the right equilibrium that takes you towards what you, what you have written in your NDC, the narrative that you've worked with with IDRI, for instance. And how do you ensure that with public policies, fiscal systems, value sharing, um, public-private partnership, you get where you want to be? And, and that's not that's not a given, and that's why multi-stakeholder multi dialogue is absolutely critical. Yeah, but then that also means in that multi-stakeholder dialogue, you're not only looking at different transport and maybe energy experts yes. and, and, and stakeholders, but also really um, include finance ministries, um, yes. private uh, banks, um, mm -hmm. public investors, etc. So again, another sort of set of people we don't regularly talk to that we might not even have the same vocabulary with. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So that makes it even more challenging, but uh, yes. I think it's it's absolutely essential. You're right. Um, Rita, any um, further observations from your side? Uh, yeah, I think uh, first is what Hannah mentioned about the Delhi example. The Delhi Metro has really been a, a, a trailblazer in, in, of sorts. And I know in the previous session, there was discussion around CDM, reference to CDM. And in fact, the Delhi Metro was the first metro rail project in the world to get an energy efficiency CDM for their regenerative braking system. Uh, and, and that was years ago. Uh, and now it is, of course, sourcing uh, electricity from uh, PV. 
So, so it's an interesting example, but I'd also like to uh, refer to what Nicola just said about the importance of economic instruments. And that is one of the points that, uh, you know, the India Roadmap emphasizes on that there is, uh, there is the need to provide different incentives, particularly uh, incentives towards low carbon fuel options and electric vehicles that would help in making the shift or the transition to low carbon mobility uh, much more, uh, you know, uh, would make it uh, critical for, for the transition. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, in terms of incentives towards making uh, EVs, uh, you know, uh, be under priority sector lending for banks, or also to include uh, sustainable fuel options like bio CNG, bio LNG, et cetera, uh, under uniform uh, taxation uh, that we have in the country in terms of GST, uh, bringing them in a lower bracket. And also uh, one important suggestion that has come up is in terms of what you referred to as the importance of interconnectedness between different mobility options. And therefore the importance of earmarking a substantial budget towards infrastructure that would create that kind of interface. For instance, multimodal logistic parks, bus ports, surplus ports, highway amenities, et cetera, that would actually make the integration much more seamless and lead to greater efficiencies in intermodal and intramodal uh, transport options. So some of these uh, will become really underlying success factors for, for sustainable mobility. Thanks a lot. Um, we have five minutes left. So I would um, ask each of you for one minute to have your final message, how you think we governments can strengthen transport in the NDCs. Lucy, can you start? Let's go first again. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's, as I say, I think it's really about, um, um, full system thinking, clear targets, absolutely crystal clear policy um, and, and, and a, a fiscal uh, system that actually backs up what, what, what the messages are um, to, make it, to make it real, to come real. Hannah. All right, so I'll, I guess I won't go back into repeating all of the uh all of my spiel on uh, integration, how the, there needs to be more cross-sectoral um, communication and dialogues. But uh, another point that I'd like to add, I guess, just in closing, and this follows up on the, the financing question, um, and also what Varina said in the previous panel, that um, these subsidies are for fossil fuels is a clear con conflict in the sector. Um, not just for transport, this is across the, the energy, all energy end uses. And uh, to put it in, in context, I mean, 400 billion US dollars uh, were the, the subsidies that have gone to fossil fuel cons consumption in recent years. And this is about double the estimated support for renewable power generation. Um, and if we consider all the negative externalities, then there's, this is even trillions of dollars. So I think that uh, getting rid of some of these conflicting policies um, could free up some finances, uh, especially if these other tax uh, revenue sources are are taken away. Nicola. So I, I would repeat the same about the, the stakeholder dialogue, but instead, you know, for a country, my advice to a country, instead of recreating something from scratch, look at what exists today and the organization that exists. You know, we IDRI is going to be very helpful, Transport Decarbonization Alliance, Sum for All, SLOCAT, ITF, moving on, all these exist and are there to, to help and to provide tools to help countries engage in, uh, in, in a fruitful stakeholder dialogues and also have tools that they can share with the countries. Great, I think that's very practical advice. Rita. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in India, we have uh, several national level policies that the government has come up with from 2006 onwards for, for urban transport, for electric mobility, for transformative mobility, uh, long-term national transport policy. So, I mean, there are several policies that the government has 
put in place. Uh, what is critical, I think, in the Indian context and the challenge lies there is that we have several, we have at least six to seven ministries who are looking at transport in various ways or mobility in various ways. And therefore, integration at the national level will be very, very critical to, to have an integrated planning on transport uh, decarbonization. And uh, also the fact that uh, in the Indian context, given the federal structure and, and the fact that transportation comes under uh, the concurrent list, so both national and state governments and the state governments have their own set of uh, you know, policies and regulations. So an integrated approach at the national level with, will be absolutely very, very important to drive sustainable mobility. Uh, that's one. The other is, of course, the importance of continuing to have multi-stakeholder dialogues because that will bring a lot of practical experience and insights into policy, uh, policy and planning process. And, and not to mention the fact that uh, in all this planning, uh, it's important to focus on multimodality. It's important to focus on interoperability. And of course, the design and uh, the development and implementation of standards. I think these would be very, very critical in terms of uh, having a, an integrated approach to sustainable mobility. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, this was very, very interesting. And I want to thank all of you for uh, taking the time to share your thoughts and experiences with uh, the audience. And I'm now handing back to uh, Mark for the closing remarks. Thank, thank you very much, Maria, um, for, the, for, for moderating for us there. Um, and we come now into the into the last few minutes of our of our session. Um, we said one of the objectives was to make the link with this opportunity now, um, um, with the with the economic reset, building back better. Um, and, I, and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce um, David Vaskov, who's from who's the director of international climate initiative at the WRI, who's one of the en route to COP26 co-organizers who's going to briefly tell us about the, the, the work he's been doing very recently and very relevant to this discussion on NDC hunt enhancement um, and, the, and the economic recovery. Um, David, you have the floor. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, and, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and this discussion has been very interesting. Um, just as some background, um, I lead the International Climate Initiative at WRI, which has been focused quite a bit on uh, the question of enhancement of NDCs and strengthening ambition for the past several years. And this past spring, when it became um, clear that um, COVID was going to be an all-encompassing challenge and that we were headed toward efforts um, uh, at recovery and stimulus to address um, the context we faced, our, we faced um, that it was going to be critical to look at how the COVID recovery process, um, which may be prolonged, um, and the enhancement of NDCs could work in tandem. And um, so uh, colleagues at WRI, Tarn Franzen and Joel Jager and I published a WRI commentary looking at these links um, to try to understand a bit um, what a framework could be to think about the connections between uh, the COVID recovery process and uh, what could be done in the enhancement of NDCs this year and next year, uh, heading up to COP26. Um, so if you could flip to the first slide. Um, there, there are both um, similarities um, and um, differences between uh, what needs to happen with COVID recovery and with NDC enhancement. Um, and what we aimed to do was to set out a sort of uh, a, a structure for thinking about how these pieces fit together. Um, there are clearly similarities in the sense that um, climate action as part of uh, COVID recovery, green and resilient and inclusive recovery, as it's often referred to, um, can help stimulate economies, um, provide jobs, and uh, otherwise uh, spur a number of economic and development 
on benefits. Similarly, the ways in which climate action are, uh, is built into NDCs and the targets and the goals and the measures in NDCs can have some of the same effects. But there are clear distinctions as well that need to be drawn between what we um, can do in a COVID recovery context and what NDCs are aimed at. Um, so to um, give a sense of uh, some of that, um, we um, uh, drew in part on some uh, work that the World Bank is doing and, and others are doing to outline uh, what uh, those distinctions might be, how to think about each of these uh, distinctly. So in the case of COVID recovery, it's clearly aimed at prioritizing economic revitaliz revitalization and job creation in the near term. Um, it's meant to have strong economic multipliers and it can be implemented or ought to be able to be implemented right away. Um, by distinction, NDCs really chart a longer term direction of travel. Um, they're updated every five years, as you know, and uh, they can create a policy context for steering investment um, and also send signals to attract um, climate uh, finance and investment. So th these are these are distinct roles, but again, they they can be quite complementary and mutually supportive. And um, this building blocks approach that um, we propose as a framework is aimed at understanding or laying out, in a sense, um, what uh, we might think of when we're looking at these um, uh, distinct roles. So climate measures with immediate stimulus um, benefits is sort of that underlying layer as part of the COVID recovery. There are climate measures that could be taken um, in tandem with or alongside COVID recovery, things like carbon pricing, fossil fuel subsidy reform, uh, and research and development that might have more uh, midterm benefits, if you will. And then of course, there are the 2030 goals, both those in NDCs and in the SDGs um, that are congruent. And then finally, of course, we're aiming for 2050 mid-century outcomes um, for net zero emissions and, and climate resilience. So this is the overarching framework. And then the question becomes, if you can turn to the next slide, um, how do we think about this in, in specific policy contexts? And I should say here that we were very much looking at the ways in which recovery um, can provide benefits in terms of climate outcomes and a green and resilient approach. Um, it's fair to say that some of those building blocks might actually um, uh, be crumpling, um, if you will, uh, if they are pointed in the wrong direction. And I think we heard earlier mention of infrastructure investments that might actually be harmful and not helpful. So I do think that's important to keep in mind. Um, but with that said, we wanted to look at how recovery measures and, and um, uh, measures in NDCs might in fact be um, complementary and, and support one another. Um, so just a couple of examples from the transport um, investment in high quality public transport and infrastructure um, for active transport is something that can be done as part of recovery. What can be done in NDCs that supports that um, is to have modal shift targets for rail, bus, and active transport. Um, those can be done in terms of, and have been done in some NDCs, in terms of numbers of trips, numbers of passenger miles, percentage um, uh, increase in um, public transport, for example. Um, EVs is another area in which recovery measures can be quite helpful. For example, funding charging infrastructure um, for EVs, support for the manufacture and purchase of EVs. And in NDCs, um, as a complement, um, setting vehicle electrification targets and um, ICE phase out targets. So these are the kinds of ways in which these can fit together. One point I would make here is I think that the NDCs play a quite critical role in setting that longer term direction of travel. Um, for example, we saw in the recovery in 2008-2009, um, and this has been pointed out in a paper recently done um, by colleagues at WRI, including Joel Jager, um, that car scrapping schemes were adopted by a number of countries. Um, eight of the 10 largest car manufacturing countries had car scrapping schemes that were at least ostensibly aimed um, in part at increasing car efficiency as, as purchasers went to um, newer cars. However, the evidence is that it did not have that effect. There, there was not a, um, a, a, a spur to um, more efficient vehicle um, purchases um, and use on the roads. And um, so what we saw there is that stimulus measures 
um, didn't have the effect they were meant to because they weren't set in a context where we had longer term targets on, uh, on transport that were gonna drive the market in the right direction. So having these together, finding ways to um, uh, have both the recovery measures and the NDCs work in tandem is gonna be quite critically important. The last point I'll make here is just the, the importance, and this has been said already, I think, of building a, a sort of people-centered approach, an equity-based approach into all of this. Um, and I would just note, I think we have a challenge coming out of um, COVID um, with public transport in particular, and are gonna need to find ways to invest in it um, and to make sure also that NDCs help buttress um, those investments with targets for, um, for, for modal shifts. So I'll end with that. Thank you. And um, I think we're nearly at time, but happy to take any quick questions. Uh, uh, thank, thank you very much, David. That's very, um, um, very relevant and very timely kind of report. Thank you very much for that brief overview. We've included the link for people to the report in the chat so people can go directly to the report. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions as we need to close. Um, um, just as we come to the end, yeah, very interesting session. Um, clear message about the need for this kind of orchestration of all these different stakeholders and the importance of that to build the, the consensus to move ahead. Um, uh, we heard about this kind of separation um, of tasks between climate and transport people. Like we heard about that from Argentina, also in Verena's experience, and the importance of this kind of local context. So um, that was very good. We also need this message, clear message on the need for this policy coherence. Um, no point doing this in one place need to be mainstream climate policy in other plans and investments across the, um, the sector, phase out fossil fuel subsidies. Um, yeah, this mainstreaming, it's also about gender, it's also about marginalized people. Um, so it's not, it's not a purely technical topic. It's a lot about governance um, and getting everyone on board and, and thinking, um, mainstreaming these topics across the whole um, of public policy. Yeah, last few points there on, on, on finance involving need, the need for investment, triggering private investment as well as public fi finance um, um, and aligning those with, with transport and climate um, priorities. And of course, all of this adds together, as we saw in the poll, this is a major, major governance challenge. Um, it's probably a bigger governance challenge than it is a technical challenge. Um, but some certainly signs for, certainly strong signs for optimism. We heard interesting stuff about what they're doing in Argentina and India. So we hope that you found this session um, interesting um, and I pass to Marion um, to close. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, I, I can just um, thank all the, uh, all the panelists again um, for sharing their thoughts. I think, uh, Mark, you summarized um, this very nicely. Uh, I think it's all about um, dialogue and talking to each other and better understanding each other and understanding the overall system um, and the implications of different routes that we can take within those systems. So um, there's a lot to do, but I think there's also, um, as a lot of um, the panelists demonstrated, there is a lot of uh, great things happening already. There's a lot of organizations that can help you. There is um, tools out there that can help you to um, embark on this journey in your country to actually come to country-driven and uh, solutions that, that fit your specific context. So um, we hope to see a lot of you again in uh, the next sessions. Um, over the next two days with the closing session on uh, Thursday, uh, December 3rd. So um, thanks for everybody for joining and staying with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.